Welcome to American Architecture Now. I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein, and our guest this evening is James Stewart Polshek, who is a leading architect and educator, dean of the School of Architecture at Columbia University. He is involved in the world of New York public works design as a consultant and advisor to many large groups. This has also helped enhance the reputation of his school, where he has encouraged the university administration to hire more top quality architects. In the Polshek years at Columbia, there have been works on campus by Romaldo Jergola, Robert Stern, Alexander Kuzminov, Gwathmi Siegel, and others, reversing a trend toward mediocre structures by commercial architects. In addition, he has an active private architectural practice, and among his best known works are the Quinco Mental Health Center in Columbus, Indiana, the Friends Meeting House Brotherhood Synagogue on Gramercy Park in New York, Twin Parks Housing in the Bronx, and the Tenjin Central Research Institute in Tokyo. For the past eight years, you have been the Dean of Columbia School of Architecture. How did you first become interested in architectural education? I wasn't. Uh, uh, a very dear friend, uh, Max Bond, uh, one of our new planning commissioners and uh, the new chairman of the Department of Architecture starting next uh, fall at Columbia, uh, called me one uh, rainy day and said, uh, why don't you come up here? We're on the search committee and we're getting nowhere. And I said, I have no interest in it. And I discussed it with my uh, my wife. And uh, we thought it would be worth a ride uptown on the theory that whenever you're asked to be interviewed for anything, uh, do it, even if you're not interested. And so I did go up. And one thing led to another. And I became the dean. Uh, it was just about as simple as that. And I became uh, increasingly interested in architectural education. You've helped to raise, as I mentioned, the level of architecture on the Columbia campus. How has the process of selecting architects changed? Well, for many, many years, um, the selection of architects for major research universities, uh, meaning well-endowed private universities, uh, is that uh, if you have a president who's interested in architecture or the quality of physical life, uh, such as Whitney Griswold at Yale, then they take a deep interest in that. And I think back at that time, in fact, Griswold had a daughter who was married to an architect, and that didn't hurt. Uh, at Columbia, that was not the case. Like anything in New York, it seemed for many, many years to dwell on power and the sources of power and a kind of old boy network that was linked to the trustees. And uh, when I came to Columbia, before I accepted the position, I uh, uh, asked that the president write to me and put into writing the fact that I would be his special advisor on all planning and design. And uh, then we had an informal agreement that I would uh, set up the process, reform the process, and have the final, essentially the final sign-off on uh, the selection of any architect for all buildings. So you fill two roles at Columbia, both the Dean of the School of Architecture and Special Consultant to the President. And I guess the way you get things done is by that special relationship with the President. Well, you kind of leverage one against the other. But uh, one is paid and one is unpaid. But that has worked very well. As a matter of fact, it's worked remarkably well, and there are many architects doing their first buildings, many important architects doing their first buildings in New York City as a result of that, and I think I'm, I'm very proud of that. Well, you have cause to be. Who are they? Well, the first major building was done by Mitchell Jurgela, which is the Fairchild Life Science Building. And the uh, next big building uh, uh, is just being completed by uh, Gwathmi Siegel, which is a uh, $23 million uh, dormitory and student uh, center. And the third big building is uh, just beginning in design by James Sterling and Partners, uh, which is a new chemistry building. And along the way, there have been other things. Richard Datner is uh, doing Baker Field over at Prentice and Chan and doing the East Asian Library. And Robert Stern did a law school uh, uh, dining uh, student commons complex. And uh, uh, there have been a number of other planning studies. Younger members of the faculty are doing work in, for various deans and other schools. And uh, it's a very active place. Well, in the light of all of this, what would you say the prognosis for future quality design on the Columbia campus is? It's good. 
even if you weren't there? I think a pattern's been set. I don't think that the faculty would sit still for the situation that existed before where the president would go out and hire architects, uh, which would actually, and, and bad architects or mediocre architects, uh, and, and really flaunt that in the face of, uh, of the school. I mean, it simply would be unconscionable. Well, has this responsibility had any significant effect on your own work? Both being so deeply it's involved. It's just taken a lot of time, that's all. I mean, I feel responsible to the profession, that's why I do it. I also feel responsible for good buildings, and most importantly, I'm appalled by ugly buildings, and uh, there are a lot of them that were built. Well, the profound involvement in a school of architecture, both with your peers and with students, no doubt must have some effect on your work, does it? The student, yes. I mean, that, my. My peers, I don't know. I mean, the peer that I respect most is Sterling, so I'm very, I hope he doesn't fall on his face with this building. But um, the students have had a, a, a very great effect on my work. And I think the, the, the students in combination with the young people in the office, because I can't really separate the two, uh, it makes one think constantly about what you're doing. And it keeps you from falling into patterns that, uh, that uh, might be more profitable but uh, nevertheless, uh, in the end, are deadening. So it's, it's been quite significant. Uh, Mr. Sterling, since you've mentioned him, is perhaps best known, I guess, for his other university building at Leicester. Mm. Will this building in any way be reminiscent either in inspiration or execution with that one? I don't think so, because he's changing all the time, and also the context is very different. And so I, I, it's, I've, I've seen doodles, but I what is his talk responsibility about in uh, there? What building? The chemistry. So it's also you know it's a, it's a, the other was an engineering building, but um, I think he's a very he's a very great architect, and I don't know what he's going to come up with. I have a hunch. Do you want to give us a no, no, no previews, no sneak previews. You spent an early part of your practice in Japan, and are still very well connected to the Japanese architectural establishment. Can you tell us about how and when that Cinderella kind of involvement began? Um, I did a, uh, my first commission with a, uh, with a fellow student, a woman named uh, Vika Schneewind, uh, right after, well not right after, a few years after we got out of school. Uh, and I was still working for another architect. It was a little house in the country. Uh, 1,250 square feet well, and $18,000. Know how do you know that? How much? 18000 that's right. <laughs> and the heating system was in the ceiling, which didn't work, because I wanted to keep the building <laughs> close to the ground. Uh, but they're still friends. And then they uh, then commissioned me, to, <laughs> commissioned me to do another house, a townhouse for them, on, uh, right over here on 11th Street. And um, the first house was published it was the first thing I ever had published. I didn't know how you get published, so I walked into Elizabeth Sverbeyev, who was at the New York Times then, doing the Sunday Times Magazine. Am I supposed to be talking to you or to... Any the, place you like. Oh, okay. Um, and I said, I have some slides here, and uh, I think it's a nice house, and she published it, which was very nice. Um, and then I did the second house, and one night they had... Uh, their, these, these people were very eminent scientists, and they uh, were entertaining uh, a, 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 a Japanese mogul. You were then about 29 years old. That's sort of the significant I was part of yeah, I was under. Yeah, I was about 29. Um, and um, I, I, I can't remember all the events exactly, but I went over one morning wearing, I don't know, some kind of, you know, at that time, hippie outfit uh, to, to check out something in the house that wasn't working. And I think that the, 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 the Japanese industrialist and his wife was there, and he was an extremely powerful figure in Japan, as was she. And uh, she saw me, and I think, thought I was very bohemian. I think this is the story, the true story that's never really come out. <laughs> and then we went to dinner there, I think, uh, Ellen and I, and, um, and in the course of dinner, he said, would you like to come to Japan and design a building? And I said, okay, you know, thinking this was not gonna happen. And, um, <coughs> Had you ever been to Japan before? No, 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 my God, no, I hated it. I was scared to death of airplanes besides. <laughs> so, uh, uh, kind of hoping it didn't happen. And three months later, uh, I was working for an office here in New York, and the receptionist came in and said, there are seven Japanese gentlemen to see you. <laughs> I mean, it was very weird. I, was, I remember I was working on the Juilliard School at the time, uh, at Lincoln Center. And uh, I went out to see them, and they said that, um, that 
they wanted to talk to me and they wanted me to come to Japan uh, to negotiate a contract or, or whatever. I mean, they don't do that. Japanese don't negotiate contracts in the way we do. I mean, you don't sign something. So I went home and said, I'm going to Japan. And my friends all took me to the airport a week later, or two weeks later, and literally poured me onto a plane. Uh, and I came back with a commission. And I packed up the whole family. And we left, and we lived there for a year and a half or thereabouts, commuted back and forth a bit. And then while I was there, he said, we want another building. I wonder what the first building was that led to the second. Well, it was a huge basic research laboratory a building that today would be a $20, $25 million building. Uh, very complicated uh, in program and such. And uh, it, they had a Japanese construction company. And I picked two or three people to assist me from there, uh, a couple of whom spoke English. And we got, we isolated ourselves. And I was scared to death. And I flew by the seat of my pants. I and mean, I went from a brownstone to a building like that. And um, then the second building was a, that was a sort of vertical slab. And not entirely successfully uh, in, in every way. But I won't talk about that now. I mean, the low administration wing was really not integrated with the tower. And um, then I got a second building to do, which is a, an applied research building and little for dyers and weavers and spinners. It's in the textile industry on an open industrial plain just north of Kyoto or east of Kyoto. And, um, and that was a much more interesting building to me, about the same size, actually, but a very different program, and did that one, too. And you do those in sequence? Yeah. And then Actually, one I hadn't quite ended, and it was a it was a total Cinderella business. I mean, they didn't have furniture then at that time, so I would get old interiors magazines, and I thought Ward Bennett, and still do think Ward Bennett is uh, one of the only really wonderful designers around. I mean, there are a few others now, but uh, I would get pictures of his furniture that he was doing then for Lehigh, I think, uh, and I would say, I want that chair to the Japanese. They'd come back with shop drawings, and I'd adjust the proportions a little bit, and they'd make it. And it was that way with vinyl. They, they'd never seen solid color vinyl asbestos tile. Where are we now, 1960? 62, 63. And uh, anything I wanted, I got. I mean, there were arguments, but not knowing a language works two ways. <laughs> when you returned to this country, with what firm did you work? What did I work with? I didn't. I never worked again for anybody. I worked for pay when I got out of Yale. And then I went to Europe on a Fulbright. And when I got back, I worked for Ricky Franson, who had just left Pay's office for about three years. And then I worked and got fired by a series of architects, mostly for insubordination. And then I went to Japan. When you came back, you started your own practice. Yep. Well, now you teach. That was 63, because I, I remember I was working at home on the, the time that John Kennedy was assassinated. And you always remember where you are at moments like that. And I know I was working on my drafting table at home. Well, now you teach, run an architectural school, head an architectural practice, and serve as a frequent consultant and jury member. I might ask how you manage to do that, how you find the hours in the day. But putting that aside, can you I say a know. word about how these various identities work? Do they ever clash? Well, they clash sometimes in terms of time, but um, no, they don't clash. They don't so do really they complement one another, these different hats that you wear, or do they different times, get in the way on occasion? I mean, I don't look, it's only work, it works for me because I have the attention span of a flea. I am, I am functionally illiterate. I mean, I read one or two books a year, which is a terrible thing to say in front of people. Particularly and, with a wife in the, pub, in the publishing business. That's, that's correct. It's, you know, we have a lot of books around the house, um, and very literate children as well. Um, <laughs> but um, so I, and I also, you know, you learn after a while. I mean, I really don't waste a minute during the day for anything. Um, uh, I mean, I, you know, I eat on the subway, or I, I correct papers, or I do budgets with my machine on the subway. Whatever you can do on the subway, I do. Or I sketch details in a little sketchbook. I just use the time very carefully. And then I was born with uh, an excess of uh, metabolic whatever. So uh, <laughs> you just keep going. Well, what do you see as your primary identity? Um, oh, I don't know. What is this, this kind of thing you pay shrinks for? <laughs> 
Well, considering the fact that your undergraduate major was in psychology, oh, that's right. I walked right and considering in the fact that you spent a great deal of time, in fact, working in clinical situations before you decided to become an architect, I assume that you must have given considerable thought to your own identity. More so than most of the rest of us. I did not. Less, probably, because I was much younger. I mean, I became interested in architecture uh, by, by an accident. And, what uh, was that accident? Some friends of my family in Akron, Ohio. God help me. Uh, Akron, Ohio. It's hard <laughs> to even say it. Now. Um, uh, asked a friend of theirs who had worked at Taliesin to come to Akron and design a house for them, and it was the first time I'd ever seen. Uh, I think a rubber plant or an Eames chair or a glass wall that went down to the floor and I thought it was very revolutionary and I, and I uh, instead of doing the obstreperous things that I was doing in those days with my friends I used to go up in the attic and build models of weird houses out of shirt cardboard which I would color and I think my family thought I had lost my mind um, and I just got interested and I gave up pre-medicine pre it was a drag I mean all that chemistry and stuff that you have to do if it hadn't been for that I probably would have gone straight ahead into what I really was interested in at the time well it was revolutionary at least it was considered revolutionary then and more and more thought is being given to that movement that some say has first been hailed and now failed as an instrument of social salvation. In a recent piece in the New York Review of Books, Ada Louise Huxtable said that architecture now is at a genuine crossroads, quite unlike that of any other time in its history. I wonder, she adds that architects are now backing away blindly from a sociological or environmental context and into the realm of pure art again. I wonder if you would comment on that age-old struggle that architects, I guess, have always battled over, whether their mission was to create art first and serve social needs second. What's your estimate of that debate? I don't know quite how to phrase it because I talk about it so much. I, mean, I just don't want to be insulting to anybody. Um, well, I read Ada Louise's article in the New York Review of Books, and I think I told her, uh, uh, and I'll tell you that I thought it was, for the most part, a very courageous piece of work. And uh, uh, she told uh, me that it was very difficult to write that way in the New York Times. Uh, after all, can you imagine? criticizing Bloomingdale's in the New York Times as a piece of architectural criticism, uh, it would, uh, you'd be fired the next day. Uh, Why do you think it was so courageous? Well, for one thing, she publicly took on Philip Johnson. Uh, there was then, at the end, it kind of, I thought, wound down, you know, in, in a way that, that uh, was unfortunate. But that's beside the point. I well, think rather that than what reducing it to individuals or one particular article, I should talk about the larger yeah, issue, and yeah. that is the validity of modernism or the meaningfulness of the well, postmodernist movement. Well, it's a, it's a lot of, I mean, a lot, I think it's a lot of nonsense. I mean, the whole arg argument, I think, is kind of inconsequential. Uh, people well, are different. Well, debate I mean, is raging over what... Well, I don't, I think it's a journalistic debate. I mean, I think it's a debate, to a large extent, I think it's a debate upon, amongst people who don't do it as opposed to a debate between people who do it. So many yeah. architects so involved in that, both writing and discussing. There are. I yes. don't think so. Um, I, I think... Uh, Mr. Stern, Mr. Well, Graves, Bob Mr. is, uh, you know, he's... Uh, he is, he's one, name two. Mr. Graves? <laughs> no, Mr. Graves doesn't, actually. He does not... Mr. Moore? No, he really doesn't either. They, Mr. Venturi? Mr. Well, he Johnson? doesn't anymore. Mr. Johnson does it as a matter of, uh, yes, he does. But rather than, but that's again, okay. I really I mean, would like to address the issue, and that is, where do you stand, other than the fact that you find it... Again, him. In what way? I think that, uh, that, let's go back to your first question, the more serious one, about architecture for social purposes. There was an article by Paul Goldberger today, yesterday mm -hmm. about a symposium we had at Columbia. It was very interesting last Saturday. Um, I, don't, I really don't think that, 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 I think that young architects today 
uh, students and younger practitioners express themselves differently and have obviously different concerns. Um, it does not mean that they are any necessarily less concerned. They may be more scared and they don't talk about it so much, but they're less concerned about the application of their skills to social problems. I think they are more realistic about the limitations of those skills. Because for all the ranting and raving, and I was one of the ranters uh, in, in 68, um, uh, in, in the end, architecture is, I believe, an ex inherently conservative profession. I don't mean conservative politically. I mean conservative in the sense that it depends upon vast amounts of human labor, slaves, or in the absence of slaves, vast amounts of money and machines. And you have to create something. It is not like painting or sculpture. I mean, you can't go off into a corner and do it. And to that sense, architecture is inextricably connected to whatever social political establishment you happen to be working in. And I think that a lot of the people and a lot of these uh, 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 wonderful, idealistic people that graduated in 70, um, to, to, to a certain extent, I, I was feared, for instance, Saturday, there would be a kind of backslapping, sort of saying, weren't we wonderful? And it really wasn't that. I think there was a kind of honest expression of the limitations that they found in the end. I believe that an architect, on the other hand, uh, that, that's why I think all these, you know, the pastiche of postmodernism, of using, and I, I mean in really pastiche. Um, uh, pastiche is a bad word. How about historical quotation? No, I don't know what that means exactly. I mean, that's, I mean, that's writing. But pastiche is a word used in French building law, in zoning uh, 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 law. Uh, to uh, describe something which you are not allowed to do in certain neighborhoods. In other words, a historic district. You may not do pastiche. And I think a lot of the stuff that we're, we're, we're doing is pastiche. And I'm, I'm in the hands of a Venturi or Stern or Charlie Moore, they're really incredibly skilled uh, 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 architects, but the, the danger is that, that everybody begins to do it, and one uh, without a scholarly background, I mean, people that really don't know classical architecture from, uh, from wigwams. And, uh, and, and uh, secondly, that there is an ignorance of the fundamental compositional principles and organizational principles that make any building good, you know? I mean, strip the stuff off of Lutchens, uh, and you're going to have a very superior uh, piece of architecture. Uh, and so there is that danger. Also, it, it does affect students to a certain degree. I mean, there's the kind of uh, the creeping Bloomingdaleism, the New York magazineism that has crept uh, into architecture to a degree, and it has gone a little too far. Revisionism uh, currently the vogue in academic circles. No. I don't think so. I mean, we're really trying to teach people very serious things, you know, and uh, uh, journalists get hold of it, you know, and it's something to write about. It's, no, it's, it's the same so in all So you're fields. suggesting it's really journalists rather than architects who have created Some architects this. promote it because it's good business, you know. I mean, obviously that happens, but that's Do they design happened. it? Some design it. Some are better than others. Where has it all gone too far? Oh, I, I think that we've moved too far into this kind of art for art's sake business. I mean, it's really gotten carried away. Uh, the, 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 there is an anecdote I will tell about it, but I can't name any names, so you'll have to guess. You know, it'll be like a, what do you call it? A, a, a roman, a, cl a clay? Superb. Is that good? I was looking at my wife. <laughs> <coughs> uh, there is a competition held in a western city for a building, a tall building. And, um, and they had a budget, which was, uh, everybody knows, unrealistic for the building. And they had three final entries. And uh, one of the entries was way over the budget, and one was, and two of them were about on the budget. And uh, one, the one that finally won, picked by a very famous architect, uh, had a building that was kind of elaborately polychromed in, in um, stucco. Uh, and if you know anything about the earth, uh, and seismic questions in this far west city, you don't build a tall building out of stucco. Uh, but then on top of that, a bunch of reactionary architects in the same city raised hell, and, um, and maybe some of them were not so reactionary and well-meaning. Uh, they raised hell, and they, uh, 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 they caused the architect to make changes in the building. And what the architect had to do to make the changes was to take all uh, the post-mod off the ism. And uh, <laughs> the polychroming went, and the festoons, and the little houses, and all the al allegories, and all that stuff. So you're and, telling there. And what you're left a... with is a big gray box. So there was a big difference between his beautiful and 
drawings well, and the final execution of a design. Time will tell. I haven't seen it yet. But the but the but the lesson Actually, is. Actually, he told when he was here. Oh, okay. Well, the lesson. <laughs> the, but the, but the lesson the lesson is that an architecture which is too painterly. Uh, or too historicist, too classicizing, uh, bears within it, and, 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 and that does not seek to solve larger problems of building, of habitation, of urban design, uh, is an architecture that, uh, first of all, hasn't been built. Right? I mean, you can paint walls, you know, city wall stuff, or you know, stucco stuff that's going to collapse in a few years. But if, you're, if you really believe that the world is uh, going to go on for a bit, uh, which is not an entirely reasonable proposition, but if you do believe that, you're going to want to build buildings that, that, that hang in there for, for a while. And so I think that underneath it all, uh, there's an importance in, in principle, there's an importance in scholarly research. It's one of the problems with historic preservation also, which we could talk about. And yeah. uh, that's where uh, postmodernism, as you know, kind of, that's Charlie Jenks's yo-yo. But... Uh, the world is uh, more complex than that. Why has all this happened in the name of change, progress, creativity, commerce? Well, I know I walked into Bloomingdale's today by accident. <laughs> I was at a doctor's nearby, and I thought, you know, I saw, I saw a friend there? that had a beautiful shirt, and I thought I'd get that shirt. So I walked into Bloomingdale's, and I tell you, it was unbelievable. I mean, I don't know if anybody's been in Bloomingdale's, but it is... What's happening? Well, it's a nightmare. <laughs> it is a nightmare of, of black and thing, and you can't orient yourself, and you can't hang onto the railings. I mean, it is environmentally, in every way, you know, an, an offense to, to, to the human body and intellect. And, and, and I think that, uh, with, you know, that, that's a problem. The press has wider implications than just the marketing of all that Italian garbage they sell. Yeah. Did you get the shirt? No, I gave up. I ran out. I absolutely ran out through the freight entrance. I literally left through the freight entrance. I would not go back through all of that stuff. And they're doing more of it now, you know. <laughs> Decorators. We're going to get to that, too. Let's get into your own work for a moment first. There are certain recurring aspects to it. For example, by axial symmetry in a tripartite system oh, let's, we better of stay building. Out of that. that's, yeah, well. Perhaps you can tell us what that all means and what some of the manifestations of those recurring, in your own words, unconscious expression of yours uh, that recurs in so many of your Well, you better designs. explain that what you're quoting from is some, something that I wrote for a Japanese magazine called Space Design that did a whole issue, practically a whole issue, on the work of the office. <coughs> and they wanted to know my philosophy, so I thought, having nothing to do at 5 o'clock one morning, I wrote my philosophy out. And I did refer there to recurring formal uh, uh, organizational principles and actually f formations of building stuff. And when I said tripartite, I, mean, I do have a tendency to, to, uh, to tend to organize things in, 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 in Give three us some parts. Illustrations. Well, that's hard to do without buildings in mind, but I mean, the Bar Association's volumetric organization is actually triplicate in form. Uh, uh, recently, well, I don't know. I, it's too hard for me to draw all those things from my mind. But the other one is more important, and that is the, 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 the biaxial the organization. The University in Old Westbury, Tajan Central Research Institute. Yeah. The Bar Association. Well, I may be something Rosemary mystical. Hall, the Pool Pavilion, Wesleyan, the Intermediate A lot schools, of buildings, yeah. All, at Chappaqua, all of them yeah, a lot have of that uh, arrangement. Well, I, that plus a, a, a symmetrical organization, which for a long time, uh, I mean, I, I think I was afraid of asymmetry. I mean, in that sense, I was a child of the Beaux-Arts. But I would frequently organize buildings uh, symmetrically ar along an x-axis and asymmetrically along a y-axis. Just And I used to justify and say, I'm it's organic architecture, just like a human being. I mean, that's the way we're organized, right? We're basically symmetrical this way and asymmetrical this way. Uh, it's a bit of a crutch. It's taken me a long time to uh, uh, get out. I don't think it'll ever get out. I think that there is an inherent way uh, that I have of solving uh, problems, of organizing them that way. And if you look carefully, you can even see it in interiors. I mean, it, it crops up over and over again. Uh, and um, I don't know where it comes from. What is the major determinant of a building's ultimate form for you? Usually the circulation system. That's always the most important thing. Vertical and horizontal. 
Uh, it's, it's something, it's very important. I mean, I think, for instance, corridors are more important than rooms frequently and spend an immense amount of time on the proportions and the lighting and the color of, 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 of vertical, and, uh, vertical and horizontal circulation spaces. But more, more importantly than that, it, that's how you begin to design a building. I mean, I actually, I don't know any other way. I mean, maybe other people do. But do you think that an architect should have an easily describable, neat, definable, recognizable style? No more than a cook. Well, I good mean, cooks do. They do? I think so. I thought they always throw the book away and throw all this. I mean, that's what I do, you know. Huh? Garbage. Is in that there. how you would describe your own style? Yeah, yeah to a certain extent. Actually, actually Stern described <coughs> my style better than anybody's ever done in a issue of A plus U on was on 40, 40 under 40, and I was in the original show when I was under 40, and then he did an issue, and I was one of the 40, over 40. Uh, but in it, he said, he said, um, for as much as we argue, actually, he's very perceptive, and, and he, he said that my work was, I think, characterized by a, a dependence on classical ordering principles, but something to the effect that I always come around and break the very rules that I set up. So in that sense, it is like the cook analogy. You know, you go by the recipe, and then at the last moment, you do something uh, that uh, is unpredictable. And I like to do unpredictable things, and I like to go on the building site and change things right then and there, which is a very expensive thing to do. How do your clients feel about that? Well, if it's a big enough job, it gets all muddied up in the change orders, and they don't know. <laughs> but if it's a small job, Sometimes I end up paying for it myself. Actually, recently, for Consolidated Edison, we've just completed, which is an absolutely, I think, beautiful interior up in 181st Street. It's not even open yet. It will be in a week or two. And uh, they wouldn't pay for something at the end and uh, that I, a change I wanted. And actually, a couple of people in the office, one of the young architects, Jim Hoffman, went up with his brother-in-law, painted the wall, and I paid for it. Con Ed wouldn't pay for it, but I wanted it right. Uh, Sometimes you have to do things like that. You've been particularly interested in commissions that relate strongly to an existing context. Your historic preservation work represents one outgrowth of this. Since 1968, when you did your first historic preservation, and I'm referring to the old courthouse and jail that you did together with Mr. Toscanini right, in right, 1968 right. in the right. beginning of the State Bar Association, which was Do you work 68. for the FBI? <laughs> no. We want to have some orderly circulation system to your unfolding, uh, your work and your views. Um, we were talking about historic preservation, which has been an important part of your practice. And recycling and adaptive reuse words that you don't find particularly appealing, and I wish you'd give us a substitute. Uh, uh, the worst now is retrofitting. You know, that's from, you know, from the defense industry, retrofitting. Well, let's refer the, to them for the you moment use whatever you'd like. as sympathetic interventions yeah. into the historic texture. <laughs> and what I'm referring to are projects such as the Bar Association, the Brotherhood Synagogue, the Villard Houses, and now the Custom House. I wonder if you could tell us what your concerns are and what the solutions are that you have developed for the wide variety of problems that these projects represent. Why don't we take them one at a time because we're all aware of the fact that combining the new and the old is not only a delicate task but it's sometimes a an economically costly one. Why don't we start with the first one of real significance which was the State Bar Association. Yeah well that's the most, that was, that was mostly new building. I mean and that... Can you see, describe Well I'll problem? tell you. No. Well it's, it was a row of four brownstones uh, on, a, on a very important park in Albany, really a corner. I mean, in urban design terms, it was a very important corner of the Capitol complex up there with Richardson's state capitol as the centerpiece and then his town hall for Albany and a couple of mediocre courthouses that formed that corner. And my clients at that time, you know, nobody knew about historic preservation. Saving old buildings was something that little old ladies did, you know. Thank you. You dropped your coat. It's all right. <laughs> um, and it was their intention, they wanted a new symbol and they wanted to stick out in the park. And uh, the Hudson River Valley Commission raised hell. And I knew that they was, there was gonna be a very big problem 
which could result in the loss of the commission, <laughs> amongst other things. And uh, I did look at the street, and I knew there was a wrong thing. And also, it's part of me. I really, uh, and if given the choice to build a building on a barren green hill, and there are specific, Rosemary Hall is a good example of that. Mm -hmm. In fact, the master plan and IMP had counted on was to put the new girls' school, women's school, uh, up on the top of the hill. And I didn't want to do that. I buried it down the hillside, terraced it, so the whole thing is kind of gobbled up by the jungle. Same thing with the bar. I, I don't like to do that. I like would rather. Where it sucks. That's that may be a pro an ego problem of my own, but I would rather not, if I could avoid it, uh, be in the position to have to force myself to be a part of the continuous history of architectural new form making. I don't like to do that. I don't like to do houses, you know. I hate doing houses. I mean, I've done some houses, but they're either for clients that are so famous you can't publish them, or they're underground. Uh, what and, house was underground? Uh, it's a pool house up in Purchase. Uh, <coughs> but uh, for the same reason, I, I, I don't know why it is. Sometime, you'll, we'll have to have another session and you can tell me, <laughs> doctor. But, um, uh, so with the Bar Association, I saw that coming down the pike, and I said, look, let's save the old buildings, chop off the back. Then, there's, for one thing, in the new building, I really didn't have to be severely compromised, at least so the argument went by cornice heights and the scale on the street and so forth, and could do something that was reasonably free, and it scaled itself to the back streets and these little Dutch houses. And uh, that's the way it worked out. And all of a sudden, you know, I was in the preservation business. And uh, one that got it a lot of awards. was described as a prize winning and is the most civilized kind of architecture that served both the needs of the community and the Bar Association very well. Yeah, From very there, you went on to do a number of other well, you know, that preservation project. And we still do. I mean, a lot of the work in the, I think over a third of the work in the office is probably preservation. The Customs House, when it ever happens, is going to make it even more. That was but, the result of a national competition. Yes. Can you tell us how you got that commission? But let me tell you something else first about preservation. Preservation, like postmodernism, is getting a little carried away, also, in my view. As I sent to our mutual friend Kent Barwick, the chairman of the Landmark Preservation Commission last night, uh, uh, there could be a combination of the most reactionary forces in the society, uh, students, uh, and you know, I mean, a whole bunch of accidental comings together, people who could have a terrible backlash uh, against the kind of excessive regulatory nature of and, and the, the, the takings. Uh, that go on and the kind of fragile basis upon which is taste, you know, a bunch of commissioners of some landmark commission of whom you're one. It isn't New York City, and so it's primarily the state. But they get together and they say, well, you know, it looks nice from here. What do you mean Put it on carried the docket. away? I think actually, uh, Jim, uh, I share the concern of designating any kind of property, but that's a rather sweeping charge, really, well, to make. Good at and I wouldn't charge. like you to be leading that backlash, particularly no, no, I'm not going to lead it. I'm just when, when there you. is more sensitivity no. and understanding of the need of keeping the best. If you're not of careful, if you're buildings. not careful, it's going to disappear. Institutions, churches, universities, students, architects are going, and and, and banks are going to finally say and get to the government, and they're going to draw the line. And the next thing you know, politicians Where are going to remove the budgets. Where do you think that line should be drawn? I think that, that I think the, that the, the the judgmental basis upon which these designations are made often, and I have experienced it, are done really off the top of one's head. Where have you had that kind of experience? At Columbia. With the New York City line? No, no, not, not with New York City with the State Department of Historic Preservation. And, you know, which commissioners will walk out of Low Library and they look across at Butler and they say, oh, what a wonderful vista. We'll, we'll save the whole campus. And I mean exactly like that. A little that. hyperbole. No, it isn't. No? Oh, no, no. We have, I mean, it's documented in like reams and reams of paper. When there are reasons to save things and reasons not to save other things. Is there uh, any education in terms of, any direction in terms of the education of architects who are being taught to build in more sympathetic ways in context and adapt um, buildings that surely were not considered part of architectural education Well, I don't think the, the question past. is necessarily one of building sympathetically in terms of appearance, 
but I think they're very complex questions of, of scale and proximity, of light and dark, of, uh, of, 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 of vistas and, and visual easements, of texture. I mean, it's a very complicated business. Of, uh, there, there should be modeling of things. You know, I mean, literally modeling. How do you see this and how does it look? Uh, they're really not studied enough. I think for the budgets of preservation agent, public agencies should be, you know, not you cut. They should be raised. I mean, do you see preservation as a planning tool, ultimately? Unfortunately, I think it's becoming, see, the, the real risk is it becomes a political tool. What do you mean? I mean the politicians begin to use preservation issues to further their own uh, aims for whatever, the, for whatever reason. Uh, Can you think that, of a particular Yeah, instance? but I don't want to really go into that. That's sort of tricky stuff, and part of it's speculative. But part of it isn't. Part of it isn't. You know, it's sort of, I'm on your side. Well, not only are you but, on my but, side, you also run the most important school of historic preservation in the country. And, so uh, how do you deal with that on an ongoing well, we're trying, basis? We're struggling with exactly what you do teach people, what trying to refine the discipline, trying to create a discipline. You know, it's no longer an ethos. It's a discipline. And in the end, uh, there are two ways, of, there, there are three ways you look at it. There are conservators that are chemists, basically, like Norman Weiss, who know all about stone pathology and that mm -hmm. kind of stuff, which is, sounds funny, but it's important. Uh, did you ever see a sick stone? Well, actually, I have seen sick stones. <laughs> and then there are planners. Uh, who deal with problems of neighborhood conservation, and, you know, all the economic trade-offs and how you, all that legislative stuff. And then, then there have to be architects. And they have to be wonderfully trained architects. Are you suggesting that the only arbiters of taste or public uh, determination should be architects? When it comes to the physical matters, absolutely, positively. The staff to any kind of landmark preservation commission is all critical. The Preservation Commission has to ultimately make, you know, either accept how, or reject their judgment. What judge. jobs do you envision for these people that you're training as historic preservationists well, who are I, not architects? Conservators, technical conservators, uh, working in various planning agencies, writing legislation, guiding legislation, working for private foundations, raising money to save buildings, uh, pub publicity, publicizing, writing about it. I mean, there are a lot of things. And in fact, they're all getting wonderful jobs. So, you know. Caveats that you are now <laughs> establishing. No, not necessarily. I th in fact, we have an increasing number of students who are getting two degrees, architecture and preservation. In the past several years, you've taken on such diverse projects as the Napa Medical Center. It's a kind of drive-in medical supermarket that houses 50 different kinds of doctors. Well, no, not 50, 50 doctors, but it's California. I was going to say, of course it's California. <laughs> So some of them are not doctor doctors as we tend to know. Oh no, they're acupuncturists and uh, what do you call them? pharma people that deal in drugs, you know. I mean not <laughs> like mean not like Union Square, but I mean <laughs> deal in drugs. <laughs> Well, this medical supermarket is an idea that you originated in the East and now transported to the West. Then you've done this U.S. consulate and residence in Lyon, France, and the Delafield Estates, which are 30 new one-half million dollar houses in Riverdale, New York. Can you describe these projects to so, us? So Some of them... It's a socially, a socially important project, that last. The last one is not only socially important, if I may, you have described it as controversial. Yeah, Tell us why. Is. Well, it's con why it's controversial? Mm -hmm. And because how you've attempted a, to solve it. It's on a beautiful 10-acre site with 258 specimen trees, and the neighbors are afraid that their country lanes will be widened. And uh, our job is to place these houses on, in a way which will save as many trees as possible, and we are doing that, and to site them in ways which will complement the, the architecture of Riverdale, and we are studying that. And uh, it is a very, very, very difficult project. I mean, it, there are different projects. Some things are easy. Some things are very difficult. This is a, an exceedingly difficult project. It has questions of form, uh, questions of style, uh, of, of botany, of you know, you name it, and it's all there. Politics and so forth. But it's going ahead very nicely. And the Napa Medical Center. Well, that's almost built. See, to show you how weird California doctors are, they had to come east to find architects because they couldn't find any in San Francisco. And so I'm doing that with Peter Gluck, who is a younger uh, partner for this project, and for the Delafield Estate also uh, in the office. And uh, it's a very interesting, inexpensive building, uh, built like an aircraft carrier. Tripartite. Mm, no. 
but biaxial. <laughs> <laughs> it is, isn't it? <laughs> and circulation is very important in the building. It's like a couple of ships that have parked next to one another and thrown a gangplank from one to the other, two gangplanks. And the, the uh, open, uh, what do you call them, decks, you know, are where people walk. They're under these plywood vaults. It's a very interesting building. It would be more interesting if the budget had, had another million dollars in it for better workmanship and materials. But uh, conceptually, it's very important. And the planners gave us such a hard time. I mean, it was un unbelievable. They added at least $400,000 to the budget by delays. And now they don't like the color of the building, and they would like it changed. Of course, that's a ha-ha. What color can't. is the building? It's um, kind of uh, post-raspberry or something like that. And what else? And cream and terracotta. It's, it's Just a be, tiny bit polychrome. Not much. It's a very, actually, it's not, believe me, nobody will ever mistake that building for, uh, for one of uh, Bob Venturi's. Uh, it's a very tough looking, it's a very tough looking building. And it's a very interesting building programmatically. And very, I mean, medical buildings are interesting. I could talk about it forever. I like it a lot. Well, take a moment, I haven't please. seen it since it went up, incidentally. So. <laughs> well, I, 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 no, let's ask the next question. Let's, uh, let's well, let's talk about Lyon, France. I know it's a, uh, a consulate and a residence that you took particular pleasure, I think, in designing and has, is often, unfortunately, the case with architects. Um, it will become part of your archives. Can you tell us the evolution of that project and its current state? Well, its current state is it's dead uh, because the Office of Management and Budget of this, you know, the federal government stopped it because they thought it was going to cost too much money because there are too few Americans working in it. But it was a very important building to me and, and to the office because it formed a kind of, in my mind at least, perhaps exaggerated, a kind of continental divide in which it was a building, freestanding building, I mean, after all my ranting and raving about freestanding buildings, it is a freestanding building. Although it's in a very specific uh, situation with a beautiful park on one side, it's as if you would build villas in the edge of Central Park, exactly like that, except the park is even more beautiful than Central Park. Uh, and uh, with a big museum facing it, you know, a big, wonderful boulevard and a lot of other embassies there. But it was kind of a watershed in the sense that it brought together uh, an awful lot of things that had reappeared in buildings in the past in my work. Do you see that as a summary building for you? It summarized some things, but more importantly, it started a new direction. And more importantly than that, it started a new direction of my working in different ways with people in the office. I mean, years ago, I used to go in the, the way and do my things and come in and say, here it is. You know, like real architects are supposed to do, and many still do, I suppose. Uh, I notice on your letterhead that James Stewart Polshek now says, and partners. Yeah, they're younger partners. And during the associates. course of our conversation, you referred to the fact that you were involved in the collaborative effort with Peter Gluck, and I... On some projects. On some projects, with Max Bond on the Harlem Mall. Yeah. How does that all work? Well, it works pretty good. It stretches things out a bit. You know, when you're making decisions yourself or with somebody in your office, um, they tend to argue a little bit less than you know than somebody who is a joint adventurer with you, but 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 it works quite well because we see things in a very similar way. We I like working together with people that way, and I like working with people in the office on design questions. But I am much more absorbed today than I was when I went to Columbia. I guess one reason is there's a lot more work. But there are other reasons, too. Well, how close does a busy fellow like you get to the boards? How involved are you in the design process, and how much responsibility do you delegate? There's always people out in the audience that can answer that better. I don't know. I mean, I'm very close to it. I'm very close to everything in the office now. Um, but um, I will, I'll, I delegate more, and I will be delegating more and more, as I think there are people who, you know, are delegatable, and there are. I mean, I've, the best office I've ever had in my 16, 17 years of practice. And uh, you have to get to know people, and you have to get to, to work together and see how they work, and they have to be able to predict what you're thinking. But I'm extremely close. And one of the reasons is so banal, it's silly. It's because the office has moved, and it's on one floor. Um, before, it was on two floors. And uh, going up and down, you just don't tend to do that. You know?
for example, you've said that you have little interest in the single house commission. Yeah. Now, obviously, that your early practice it. didn't require you doing that. I mean, you went from a single house to... No, that isn't the reason. I really, house clients, I mean, I just, I don't like doing that. I don't, there's, it's either two ways. Either it's that kind of worship act, you know, where they say, oh my God, you're my artist. You know, do me something. Or, um, uh, or it's the reverse. You're a slave, like running around like some decorator over the 939 building, picking out uh, light switches and fabrics. And uh, I don't really like either one of those extremes. Well, it's interesting to hear you say that, that you don't like you know, the personal commission in the single house, and at the same time say that you're interested in interior design. You made reference earlier in this. Well, I think it's architect. I mean, it is architecture. It is a, it's a lab. You know what I'm interested in? Because there are immediate results. You can test things. You, you, you can actually, you can actually try out, you know, theories about movement and, and, and sight lines and color and, and, and lighting. You know, lighting is something you can't learn that out of a book. So I mean, this, you just have to do it. You, you have find to do it for this years. sort of mini laboratory aspect of oh, interior yeah. work it's as wonderful. being satisfying. And I thank the Consolidated Edison Company uh, profoundly. They've been a very good client, and we've had four wonderful commissions with them now, uh, three of which are interiors. And I think they will all be very interesting, and they will give them a, you know, exactly what they need. And, and we learned a lot too. I inferred from what you said earlier about interior design that you feel that the place that, I guess, most of us spend most of our lives is the most neglected area of design in this country, uh, particularly of interior design, and that is offices. Do you, is well, you, that what you meant? Yeah, sort of same thing. With, it's kind of somewhat the same preservation. I mean, you see, I really believe there are a lot of really appallingly trained people around. I mean, you wouldn't let doc. Well, they're not so terrific either when you think of it. But um, but it's there. There are, there are a lot of people that sort of have a license or, you know, like some places you don't have to have a license to, to create places for human beings to live and work in that um, aren't very well trained and don't know how to put things together very well. I'm not talking about decorating now. You know, that's, you know, you may like burgundy or red socks and I like something else, but, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the, the, the forms that, that, that people, that, that, that create or don't create anxiety, that cause you to move, that cause you to smile, that cause you to cry to the extent that that, that behavior is modified by architecture, which is something nobody knows about. So I think interiors are important and, and, uh, and, and we are doing a few in, in, in very important interiors now, too. Uh, one, uh, one, which I, you doubtless may have heard of, uh, which is an adver advertising office on 42nd Street for a firm called Backer and Spiel, Spielvogel. Uh, and that, that interior is also a kind of, when it's completed, I think will also be a kind of watershed that, that has incorporated a lot of ideas that, that came up before, like in the Simon & Schuster offices, but then have gone considerably beyond to predict uh, and to try to solve uh, problems in ways which we haven't done before. And I, it's, it's been a very important learning experience for myself and I think people in the office that have worked on it. And I think it will be uh, successful for the owners. What are the problems that you've solved as a result of that job? Well, one, um, well, we haven't solved them yet because it's not completed. I mean, it's, at the rate it's being built, it won't be completed for 30 years. But um, that's encouraging. <laughs> one is that on the main, on one of the three floors, we uh, took this wonderful facade that faces on Bryant Park and on the uh, uh, public library, and instead of putting offices against it, which the client wanted to do it for, it, saying, you know, those are nice offices, get sun. Why should we give it up to the employees? <coughs> I, we talked them into moving offices back and creating a public space, again, very much like the Napa Medical Building, kind of a, 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 a deck, you know. And then off of that are all of the major public spaces for this firm. It's library, it's exercise room, it's board room, it's lounges, it's uh, so forth and so on, which are behind a screen which kind of bends its way through there, a grid of 16-inch uh, square set in, st in burgundy steel which is sometimes gray mirror and sometimes translucent and sometimes transparent and sometimes solid. Uh, 
so that activities get indirect light or view, you see, and everybody takes advantage of this promenade. It's going to be wonderful for their clients. It'll be very nice because everybody in the entire office can share in it. So that is, I don't know if that's new. It'll, there's certainly going to be a lot of visual effects, if you wish, the uh, use of mirrors and, uh, and, uh, that are going to uh, be fairly startling. I recall when you did the uh, actually widely praised Simon & Schuster office that the reference made was that they didn't, the charge to you was that they didn't want any ad agency glitter. What did the ad agency want and what are they getting? Well, they, want, they, wanted, they didn't want any publishing glitter. <laughs> <laughs> they wanted a classic very much like Simon & Schuster. I mean, I, those are kind of clients I get along with. I mean, I have a very strong conservative streak in me, I guess, when it comes to those things. I don't like glitter either. And they both wanted a rather classical interior, kind of muted and quiet and not flashy and uh, not a lot of, you know, not Bloomingdale's. I mean, there has to be something between... Well, forget it. <laughs> we will. <laughs> Your various identities cause you to like zip back and forth between. between you know, this sounds like there used to be a program called <laughs> Queen for a Day. <laughs> <laughs> Because you just zip back and forth between the academics that deal with theory and obviously uh, businessmen who deal with another kind of reality and politicians and builders uh, that are focused on yet another reality. How do you feel that academic architects these days are treating such issues as economics, energy zoning, and so forth? What do you mean academic architects? Well, those Am that I are, one? I would say yes. I am an academic architect. Academics who are oh oh well I don't oh I don't I don't I don't I don't there's just one I mean you know there are architects and there are academics so you're not going mean, to either associate you build from either of well those no two I mean either you build or you don't build I mean that's the difference building is very scary and uh, once you do it you know you, you become somewhat sobered about things and, but I think your question is a reasonable question uh, the question was are they paying as much attention to such issues as okay. economics, energy, right. zoning, right. The answer is, than they once did. The answer is, even if you don't want to, you have to. Why? Well, I'll tell you. We're doing a school, a very, it's a wonderful project, which I didn't mention to you, uh, which is well along, or now well, I guess it's going into working drawings or something like that, is it? Yes, it is. It's, it's an addition to a middle school in, in Montclair, New Jersey, called the Glenfield Middle School which preserves the old and adds new, and it, it, I, I, I think it's going to be very nice. There are school boards on the school boards. There are environmentalists. There are Greenbelt people. There are State Department of Education people in Trenton that are into everything, including the sill heights. I mean, there are regulators on top of the regulators. There are budget guys on top of the budget guys. There is no way in hell that you can be irresponsible in that sense today. So the, most, the most important the, the trouble is that in the midst of all that, here are all these economists and botanists and planners and soils engineers and traffic people and God knows what else. Uh, in the midst of all that, you can still end up with a very mediocre and awful building that could be economically responsible, and uh, environmentally responsible, and so forth and so forth. Well, do we blame the regulars or the architects? No, you don't incident? blame the architects. How much, but how much of the building is left to the architects' oh, design? A lot, a, a lot. It just takes a lot of time, that's all. It just takes a lot of time. I mean, there are meetings now where the, with clients used to have to bring two people, you know? Now they'll come with 18. I'm not exaggerating. I mean, in private organizations, uh, corporations which will go unnamed, will bring 18 people to a meeting. And uh, that takes a lot of time. And you, in fact, get regulated to death. And the fact is that it has a very profound effect on the fees uh, that one begins to charge. How much attention do you feel the public sector is giving nowadays to design, more than before or less? Oh, I, oh, I think a lot more. I think, I really and think there's a great, manifested? I mean, everybody's buying architecture books and design books and things. How does it manifest itself? Well, I, people are visually much more sophisticated. Sometimes I wish they weren't. I remember, it wasn't so many years ago, when we came back from Finland, you know, having thought we discovered Mary Mecco and carrying baskets and, <laughs> and uh, Charlotte Perrion straw chairs. And gee, we thought we were going to open up, well, we didn't even think, who would think of a story? We were just happy to have these rare works of folk art or, or, or new design. 
Um, then Ben Thompson came along, you know, and the whole business became uh, popular so that everybody has, you know, 12 Italian clocks and uh, all that stuff. The design becomes a cliche when too many people... Well, it doesn't really, you know... You know, you know, for all the concern, for you know, for 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 all of the people concerned about the handicapped and the elderly and and and, and children and I don't know what, uh, I I am not uh, in any way convinced that we live in a society that is in any way, shape, or form more humane today than it was before all the rest of these people existed. That is the regulators. There's no reason to think that. You, you've been to 137th Street clock. lately. Is that an unnecessary class, the regulators, are you saying? No, they're not totally unnecessary. I'm just making a point that there is, they may, they may, if you talk to anybody for, in the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, they will make a direct correlation between the existence of these regulatory agencies and, 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 and the quality of life. But I'm telling you that it really does not make it. But it sort of joins the, we talked about earlier, the architecture more and more for art's sake, and then the relationships of architecture to social needs and social purposes that are being threatened. So they're not only being threatened from within, you're now suggesting from without as well, because there are so many incursions on the opportunity to design. Fine. Yes, there, there's, yes, there's no doubt about it. I mean, you really, I tell you, today, you really have to know, architects have to know how to write and talk, as well as draw, and they, you know, it is, um, architecture has, from whenever the first professional architects existed, I guess, in the 15th century, uh, uh, has, has been a kind of combination of con man and, uh, and, uh, and visionary, that, uh, and that really, that part hasn't changed, but it's increasingly rare that you have a client that you have direct contact with. You know, somebody really, we are fortunate to have a few of those left, but more and more it's committees and managers and, and, and so forth. And uh, that's not a happy state of affairs. I guess one of, the, I don't know what category you place this relationship. Perhaps someone could close that door. It is so intrusive. Or if one of the persons from the new school would please do that. Um, I don't know which category you place the role that you have uh, with the Urban Development Corporation. You've been especially active with that. I guess you serve as the consultant to UDC. Yeah. For the convention center And for Roosevelt Island, too. And, well, then why don't we talk about that for a moment. For example, uh, well, uh, that's an important role. I mean, I, there I, it's somewhat, to a certain degree, like Columbia. My role is, I see it as protecting the architect. First helping select and then to protect the architect uh, uh, and protect the integrity of the design with respect to the con construction manager and the public agencies and, and all the people that would eat away at it. Um, and uh, that's been, that's worked very well in the case of of the housing in Roosevelt Island that's projected and in the Pays Convention Center. But it's not, I tell you, it's not something I would like to do uh, every day of the week. I mean, it's meetings and things, you know, it's terrible. That's where the 18 people come. What oh, sort of... more. Lawyers. You want to talk about lawyers for a while? <laughs> Give us a sentence on lawyers. The worst. <laughs> we do what is that? Wait a minute. Now no, I now have to be reminded of this. Yes. We're going to have a world populated by architects. Shakespeare. Which is not altogether bad. Henry the Sixth, I think. There is, a, there is a line that says, First, let's kill all the lawyers. <laughs> Say, oh, we meet together in happiness and sweet accord, and I don't know if this is a note we want to inject at this uh, moment. What are the constraints that face the architect of the convention center, Mr. Pei? Oh, wow. I mean, incredible. A site that effectively is too small for the program. The program is too big for the budget. The budget's too small for his detailing. <laughs> And uh, those are a lot of constraints, but I, but but they are they really are the right architect for that commission. And Jim Freed, who is the uh, 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 design partner on the project, uh, is absolutely the perfect person. I mean, he's you know Mies van der Rohe trained, um, enormously disciplined, and uh, the office is an office that uh, has a technological capability. I mean, certainly an artistic sensitivity, but an incredible technological senses, capability and sensibility with regard to the... I mean, that whole convention center is going to have like four details in it. 
you know, repeat it endlessly. I mean, I'm exaggerating, but I mean, basically, the joint in that truss mm -hmm. or the glass detail where it hits that aluminum is going to be repeated over and over again, and it, and it better be beautiful. And it will be. In light of all these constraints and limitations, what kind of building should we expect to have? Oh. Well, you could have gone to the Museum of Modern Art to see it. It's a great crystal palace. For well, those of us um, who didn't have that opportunity it is like or a, even don't even live here. Well, it's a big barn, you know, uh, uh, essentially. But there's a main, it's a great big thing that goes from 34th to 39th Street. And then it has a bridge. You see, we did a, fee, a design study for the building, a design feasibility study to establish the price and wrote the program. And the design feasibility study that we did uh, is, in fact, uh, uncannily like the final product, what I'm happy to say. I mean, in the disposition of, of the major axes through the building and the way glass it's open and glassy to 11th Avenue and closed to 12th Avenue and so forth but then the pay office took those constraints and that budget and they've made really a remarkable object you can't describe it it's very hard did you have anything to do with the use of the public spaces there with the use of the public space yes or the well definition. I've reviewed various ideas you know that are still up in the air. And I will have a lot to say about the use of the public spaces. You've I, also acted, as you mentioned, as a consultant on Roosevelt Island, where the UDC and Starrett Housing has decided to build housing by Gwathmi Siegel mm. instead of building a winning design in a recent competition. Plans that I have recently read are now tentatively on hold. What? Is that so? You mean the Gwathmi Siegel plans? Yes. I think that'll probably go ahead. There was a reference to that in Skyline that those plans are now on hold. Yeah, be careful what you read in Skyline. So. <laughs> well, that, I, that, that's so, but I think it's temporary. Um, why was that done? Put them on hold? No, no. If there oh, was the, a prize-winning competition, why oh, are there? Well, because I'll tell you why. The developer, developers are very tough people. And the developer uh, said that I am not about to spend $50 million on some kids that have not uh, done this sort of thing before. One of those kids, and I think in, in my view, one of the best of the, I think there were four winning designs. Uh, and one of the best was Bob Stern's uh, design. He wasn't happy about not being used, but he's very realistic about it. Uh, and so I was asked to select six or five or six architects to be interviewed by the developer. And the developer chose, uh, I mean, it was a no-lose no list. Uh, but he chose uh, Charlie and Bob, uh, and I think it was a very sensible thing to do. What sort of results can we expect there? Um, well, that's a little trickier, because, I mean, the, I don't think I should comment upon that. I mean, I think it'll be, I don't think that, that Charlie Gwathney does ever does anything that isn't absolutely first rate. But I tell you, this is a, this is a battle with a developer. Can you say a word then about how Roosevelt Island itself is working out? I don't know much about that. I think it's working out all right when the tram runs. Yeah. We talked uh, earlier briefly about public awareness of design. Is there anything that can be done to increase public awareness of design priorities? How can the process of public design, the design of civic structures, be improved? Design of civic, get good architects. Well, how about the process that you just mentioned of developer architecture? Are there ways that we can improve that? Even if you had good architects, they're not permitted to do what they'd like to do. Well, the, the, the quality of developer is improving. I mean, there, there are developers that are more enlightened. There are developers that are less enlightened. They're not all bad or good like anything else. I mean, I think that, you know, that we're coming together. And I, and I think that, 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 that there are planning commissions. I mean, I really think the New York City Planning Commission, uh, it's, uh, well, what was the Urban Design Group, uh, the Office of Midtown Planning, and the various borough uh, planning offices have really excellent people in them. I mean, it's a, if there was one legacy of the Lindsay administration uh, that I think was a very good one, it's that. It's for the first time in any American city that I know, well, it's not true, Boston, uh, uh, has a, a good public authority. But it ha there's finally a group of very responsible young architects and planners that really appreciate when you do a building for a developer and you come in and you, you discuss the process with them. And they can help you or they can hinder you. Can you give us some examples of significant developer developer built buildings in New York in the last few years? Yeah, I think uh, 80 Pine Street, which is also a freed building. That's the white steel building downtown. Uh, That's a developer building, and it's a, an, an excellent building. 
looks like it should be in Chicago. But uh, that doesn't uh, say anything. Deve I don't know. Developer built buildings. No, I don't. I don't know. It's, that's a world that I'm. I'm not. You're saying that the outlook is more promising than it's been. Yeah, I think there are developers around that are. Uh, there's this recent competition for the development of the East River south of Waterside, mm -hmm. where developers and architects teamed up, and they all seem like very good teams. And I think whoever gets the job will probably be a hell of a lot better than Stuyvesant Town. What's the mood of the architectural community in New York these days in general? Is it optimistic? Is there, is a, is there a sense that we're moving toward... It's very nervous, nervous. ...an active period of good innovative work or not? Why are they no, so no, nervous? No, look at... It's just work, not good innovative work. It's, it's just are we moving into a period where... No, it's very nervous. Well, because this is... Because there's no oil... Uh, I mean, you, you don't know when the lights are going to go off. Uh, uh, there's relatively little money, and you know, inflation is insane. Uh, uh, there's been talk, insistent talk, about recession. So I would say we're all uh, very nervous. I spend an awful lot of time trying to secure commissions that uh, will be recession-proof, so that that we can keep the office together in, in those times. And I hope I'm being successful. I do too, but you might learn to love historic preservation again. No, no, we love it now a lot. We do love it a lot. I just don't want my comments misconstrued about regulators. But there's, uh, uh, as your very own chairman uh, said to me, there, there is an emerging problem. And I think that the way to deal with that problem is probably for commissions to sit down, bring other people in from other spheres of life, and maybe have some very quiet mm -hmm. sessions together. I do agree with and that. And let their hair down and say, you know, where are we at? Well, I do think that new and fruitful alliances and certainly exchanges of ideas are very important to both the preservation community and the architecture and development community. But what about the art community? Do you sense a closer set of ties to the architectural community than in the past, or is there more distance? Well, I don't, I mean, I don't, know, much, I don't know too much about the art community. I mean, I, I know what I like. Uh, what do you like? You're talking about collaborations, you mean? I'm going to get there in a moment, but what do you like? Women painters. <laughs> no, I mean paintings by women painters. I don't know why. That's very strange, but I mean, whenever I see a painting I like, it, it, it invariably turns out to be by a woman. And it may be, it may be related to the tripartite biaxial nonsense. <laughs> Yet another expression. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that as a public figure in the architectural community that you have a responsibility to encourage any collaboration between artists and architects? No. Not necessarily. I mean, I did like any kind of collaboration. Once I, I did do a competition once, just before I went to Japan with a wonderful sculptor named Robert Engman. Um, that I had met when, when I was at Yale. And we did a competition for an open space. And we got along wonderfully. And, and the only reason that um, we were late <laughs> in getting it in, because I was in Japan by that time and it was crazy. But we got along well. But um, Other than that artist, have you ever collaborated with an artist? <laughs> collaborated with an artist. Yeah, once in Japan, he got very angry with me, actually. They, the company had a sculptor, a Japanese sculptor, and I, I, it's not, names are unimportant, because I don't remember it anyway. <laughs> but, um, and, and there was a big wall, there were two walls, in fact, on the, on the end of a longitudinal axis of a major reception building, which was part of the first Japanese building. And, and uh, he, was gonna, he showed me his things, and I was a little nervous about it. And so I went out, Oh, God, he must have hated me, now that I think back. I was awful. And I went out to his kill, and I saw all these pieces from the kill lying around on the ground, you know, bricks and curved pieces and ribbed things, and some were black. And I, and I said, that's it. So I said, come on, we'll get up on a ladder. And we got up on a ladder, two very tall ladders, and we had another guy arranging these things on the ground, you know, and then I'd run down. And, but he, we both sort of got into it, and we actually made a mural, and then froze it, and then, well, he took it from there and filled it in and then built it, and it's really quite wonderful. Are there any artists with whom you'd like to work now? On what? On any project that you're involved in. I'm glad you're giving it such serious thought because... No, I just love, you know, I, I love Richard Diebenkorn, you see, you know. But I wouldn't work with him. I wouldn't be nerve even. You know, I would fall down at his feet. 
I mean, how could you talk to a person like that? And, 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 uh, I, and, and so, I mean, I, you're talking about working, you know, in a sculptural sense. You know, like with Noguchi, for instance. Yes. Well, if I had a building like the Marine Midland building, you know, I'd, uh, I'd certainly <laughs> talk to Noguchi. <laughs> Well, you know, we have uh, I like, an ongoing... You know, you know I, like ta I love uh, textile art. And I love folk art. I mean, love Japanese folk art. It's just one... I like any kind of folk art, but I particularly love Japanese folk art. But textile art is wonderful if it doesn't become another hype, which it could. But there's a wonderful gallery someplace around here, 19th Street. I can't remember the name of it now. Rod Rodri art Weave or something. No, no, something Rodriguez. Uh, I can't remember, but it's a no. wonderful gallery. I think it's on 19th or 20th Street. And I've seen extraordinary tapestries. Uh, um, and then there's the woman uh, um, who's very talented, who lives back here in New York working again, who's done some very big pieces for Skidmore. Mm. I, can't, I can't recall her name. I've never met her. No, I have that. But, uh, that, but art at that scale, you know, art in the sense of, of, of illuminating and, and, and reinforcing the vistas in a building, I mean, are really, really wonderful. But... You don't get too many, you know, you get clients and you say to them, well, you, would you like, you know, here's a, we, have tap, we need a tapestry here. And when you tell them that the tapestry is going to be $65,000, you know, they get very nervous. And, but uh, Willie and Miller. so do I, to the extent that they'd say, terrific, now we'll use cheap hardware. Mm -hmm. So you think it comes off finished costs? Well, it'll come off of some place. I mean, in a public building, if you can build it in, that's wonderful. Well, more and more, it will be a part of public buildings since that uh, bill for one half to one percent of yeah. funds uh, for art in architecture is now being marked up before our Congress. That will very soon be enacted in law into law. That is now only a yeah. gentleman's agreement on the part of the GSA. So that willy nilly, more collaboration for better or worse, you, will occur between art and architecture. What's your view of all of that, Jim? And I what should we do to really... Uh, well, I was going to ask you a question. Can I do that? Sure, sure. Well, I, you know, all the, the public art, you know, the great sculptures that for a while proliferated all over New York City, you know? Um, do, you, do, you, do, you, do you think that's illuminating to the kind of ordinary guy on the street? Well, I think part of my interest in the collaboration between art and architecture is because, and I guess I'll have to quote Georgie Kepish on this, he has talked about the, what is sometimes referred to as ephemera that has dotted this countryside as very often resembling knickknacks on the Victorian mantelpiece. You're, you're talking about the same thing. We you certainly mean, are. Yeah. And it seems to me that... Uh, Obviously, there are first-rate artists and first-rate architects who, from time to time, work together. But because of the amount of money that will be available, if nothing else, and the ideological aspects of art in public places, more concern, obviously, must be paid to that as a collaboration, not surface ornamentation, not post facto, but during the design and evolutionary you know, But then process. somebody has to build that in early. If that's, you know, if that's the, that, that's the ball game, then that's terrific. But, but it's, you, you can't talk about it in, in, as But an it's no longer as an, an abstraction since those funds are available. And one of the things that interest and somewhat concern me is that schools of architecture really should be sensitizing architects to that possibility. We can't, we Collaboration don't. at best is a fresh we don't sensitize. I mean, we are lucky to even do a little teaching. I mean, to, to, <laughs> to think that you can teach somebody a little bit about architecture in three years is, you know, uh, I mean, that's really stretching. I mean, we do it. I think we do a very good job. Uh, I think we do a better job than anybody does, for that matter. Uh, all of this ideological nonsense aside. But... Uh, but three years is a very short time, and you, you simply can't learn all that. You can't talk about building codes. or People say, you know, you teach computers to architects. Computers? Huh? What do you hope to accomplish? Teaching design. Teaching people how to, to synthesize ideas uh, and to communicate those ideas on paper to a lot of other people. I mean, that, I hear birds. I've been hearing something. <laughs> Spring. Um, there is, uh, has been almost a wistful reference to a mediocrity in many professions during the course yeah. of our conversation. What do you think of the current level of architectural education? Not only at Columbia, but in the country in general. Well, I don't know. The com country in general uh, is not, uh, it's very worrisome. It's not so terrific. Uh, it gets better. I mean, more. There's the pool of, of people who can teach is increasing. The trouble is that they all want to live in three cities. You see, 
when in fact you know, somebody has to go to Auburn or somebody has to go to to to, to Kentucky or someplace you know places that are really out of the way uh, but uh, at, at, at bigger schools, uh, I think it's okay. I think we have a long, there's a lot of things we could do. And what about the state of American architecture now? Oh boy, that's easy. I think it's pretty good actually. I think that there, you know, trouble is that you, you, you know, that the world is not made up only of Stanley Tigerman and Michael Graves and Bobby Stern and Venturi and more. I mean, there are other people. And one of the things I look, and not that they are bad or good or indifferent, we all know they're good, you know, or funny or, you know, whatever. But there are really an awful lot of architects that people don't know about practicing in a lot of out-of-the-way places, and it's not important that I name names because even I don't know about a lot of them. But I do, there are, there, there, there are people that just aren't recognized for making important contributions that don't look terrific at the Venice Biennale. You know, they probably architects never heard of the Venice Biennale. Uh, and I think that, that, the trouble, that's a kind of cult thing. And to that extent, you know, it's kind of magazine fodder and people know how to manipulate journalists and journalists know how to manipulate architects. And I'm sure it's like that in the art world. Uh, but the stakes are a little bit higher uh, here, you know. Why? Because uh, somebody publishes some, you know, goony building, you know, with a thing here or whatever. Is that a pediment? Well, I don't know what pediment? it is. You know, that's going to be a much better building when it's built than most of us uh, imagine. Incidentally, I think that, that the AT&T building is probably going to be a very fine building. But, but um, no, I didn't mean that in particular. But you publish something in a magazine, <clears throat> like in Progressive Architecture, <clears throat> I don't know what their circulation is, but it must be... I don't know, 50,000, 100,000, I doubt that. <clears throat> but a lot of people read it and bango, off they go. You, you go to kind of cities in the Midwest and occasionally you come you see some weird looking thing that looks like a, kind, of a, a kind of a Richard Meyer clone that's been chopped and sort of really, you know, and that kind of stuff happens. I mean, it really does happen. And I think that architecture is really, I mean, I've made a lot of jokes tonight because I, I guess this is what we're supposed to be entertaining, but, but I think it's very serious. And interesting, too. But I hope it was that. But, but, I, but I think it's very deadly, serious business. I don't think it's something you, you, you play games with. I think that architects must, that you can't rationalize something for a client by saying it's high art. You can't do that. I mean, the client has every right to say, well, that's ridiculous. You can't have a hold there, you know, just because you want a hold. You have, there has to be a reason. Now, it can, in fact, be a formal visual reason. You see, I would say that that could be a rationalization, but it has to have a rationalization. And it can't be that, well, I want to remind people of uh, Borromini. I mean, come on, out in, uh, you know, uh, East uh, uh, Keokuk, Iowa, you know, Borromini. <laughs> I mean, that's not right. But you are, and thank you for being so very generous with yourself and your thoughts and your ideas tonight. Thank you very much for your